Hello everyone. Salam, Namaste, Ada, and welcome to today's event. Today we are going to listen to three very established and known historians, all of them from JNU, and the opening remarks given by Professor Salil Mishra, who also is, is I mean, he was a student at JNU, and he's they are all professors of you know of history. Uh, uh, Salil Mishraji was a professor of history in Ambedkar University, Delhi, and a former pro vice chancellor. Professor Mirdula Mukherjee, Professor Aditya Mukherjee, and Professor Suchetan Mahajan, all from JNU Center of Historical Studies, and you know, well known names in their respective fields. And today's uh, title is Independence and Partition Revisited. That's a composite title, but under each name, you will see that they have uh, allotted themselves precisely 15 minutes, and I hope that they will look at their watches. Uh, I'm not going to have this unpleasant uh, duty to remind them, uh, but hopefully uh, they will finish their many talks and then move on to question and answer. Uh, so Mirdula Ji will talk on Gandhi and Nehru Loom large, no eraser possible. Uh, Professor Aditya Mukherjee will talk on Nehru's Temple of Modern India. And Professor, Professor Sucheta Mahajan on partition fault lines, its after effects in present time. So uh, I invite Professor Salil Mishraji uh, for the opening remarks. Uh, Salil Mishraji, welcome. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I'm really honored. <clears throat> Uh, that uh, I was given this opportunity to uh, uh, make some opening remarks. The theme uh, of the three discussions has already been communicated to you. Let me just make one or two um, initial points and then hand over uh, firstly to Professor Murdula Mukherjee and then Professor Aditya Mukherjee and then Professor uh, Murdula Mahajan. Well, friends, I think that the three themes, uh, uh, three commentaries today, the three themes are relevant, they are contemporaneous, and they are also connected with each other. There is a connection which is uh, very important, and let me just focus on that uh, connection. Let me make the following observation. Uh, throughout the history of ideas, uh, we have seen that superior ideas also tend to be minority ideas. That's a kind of a dilemma that we have to live with. Superior ideas is a minority accomplishment. These ideas tend to circulate in a very small uh, group, these superior ideas. But then strangely, we also find that during the course of the national movement, Indian national movement, the enlightened ideas of inclusive Indian nationalism, secularism, pluralism, were not really the insular elite ideas. Uh, an amazingly large number of people had internalized these ideas, had believed in them, had practiced them, and based their politics, political activities on the basis of these enlightened ideas. We had an enlightened mass movement. We should recognize this under the leadership of Gandhi, Nehru, and many, many others. And I think the relevance of their ideas and why these ideas have survived and why an erasure is not all that easy, I think Professor Murdula Mukherjee will speak about that. When Jawaharlal Nehru took over in 1947, he not only advanced these ideas forward and further, but also created institutions and a policy framework which was based on those very ideas. So it will be very interesting to see what happens to those ideas after 1947 under the leadership of Nehru. And I think Professor Aditya Mukherjee is going to talk about that. Friends, our independence was also accompanied by the partition of the subcontinent. And this created a great challenge to our leadership then. And it also, it continues to create a kind of a challenge to us uh, even today. Even today, it's a, a great challenge. How to make sense of it, how to uh, connect it with independence, 
uh, what have been the kind of battle of ideas, debates, why is it that partition today has become very important? Can we, have, can we afford not to talk about it? So what has happened to partition and the stages that it has gone through? That is the theme of uh, Professor uh, uh, Sucheta Mahajan today. So we have the very, very um, connected uh, ideas, very important ideas, and we are all looking forward to uh, the speakers. So maybe I think we should start with the Professor Murdula Mukherjee. Murdula, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, you are. Okay. All right. Uh, in which case, I'll go right ahead then. I'll begin by uh, thanking very warmly the Indian diaspora group based in Washington, D.C., led by uh, Dr. Razi Rajuddin, who's been uh, organizing these uh, very wonderful sessions, many of which I have heard uh, over the last more than one year. And I think we have to appreciate the tremendous amount of effort and organizational uh, ability and commitment and dedication to the cause uh, of India, of a good, humane, secular India that lies behind this. So I'd like to place on record, first of all, my appreciation I'd also like to place on record that I always see that Mrs. Razuddin is there, always in every program, and her presence, and I'm sure her strong support has also to be acknowledged, without which I'm sure this would not be possible. So I have always watched her there constantly, most interestedly following each program diligently. I'd like to now uh, move to the uh, subject uh, of my talk today. The time is very short, so I'll get into it uh, uh, right away. The topic that was uh, given to me is very interesting. Gandhi and Nehru loom large and no erasure is possible. Now, there is absolutely no doubt that if you look at the broad canvas of history, of world history, then Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru indeed loom large, with Gandhiji looming even larger than Nehru, a fact that Nehru would happily acknowledge as he saw himself as a disciple of the master. Gandhiji's unshakable stature emerged from his stewardship of arguably the largest mass movement in world history, which ended colonial rule in the largest colony the jewel in the British crown. His unique position as a theorist and practitioner of nonviolent civil disobedience on a scale involving millions in political action was cemented when leaders of the oppressed like Martin Luther King Jr. emulated his example. Jawaharlal Nehru as prime minister of the first independent colony charted a unique path of building a civil libertarian secular democracy while pursuing a strategy of independent economic development. His refusal to join either of the blocs in the Cold War, in the post-war world order, and conceptualizing a third bloc of non-aligned countries, mostly newly independent colonies, too established his position as a world statesman. As a young radical leader of India's freedom struggle, he was already a hero among the youth in the colonial world in Asia and Africa. Then why do we have to reassert today that Gandhi and Nehru loom large, no erasure possible? We all know the answer to this rhetorical question. It is because in their Karma Bhumi, in India, and by sections of the Indian diaspora, that very erasure which could not even be thought of, is today being attempted. Let me also uh, remind you that this effort at erasure of Gandhi and Nehru and their contribution is part of a larger project in which history is being weaponized to further the political agenda and interests of powerful, power-seeking, 
and ideologically driven political formations and individuals. These are not happening just by chance. The new interest in the subject of history has little or nothing to do with a genuine interest in learning about the past, but it has everything today to do with present day politics. While much of the more visible or audible debates are about the character of rulers and of monuments built in the medieval period of Indian history, about which we do not have time to talk about today, but another day, Certainly, I would, uh, I would imagine that uh, Dr. Rajuddin would organize a discussion. But there are, in fact, many other areas where a less audible but equally significant war is being waged. Let me give you an example. In the Indian Council for Historical, the Indian Council for Historical Research has been engaged in an exercise to revise the list of the heroes of the freedom struggle. They say that they want to bring in the unsung heroes. They dropped Jawaharlal Nehru from a collage on a poster which announced a lecture series commemorating 75 years of independence in favor of their current favorite, one guess, Savarkar. Another subtler method in the name of celebrating unsung heroes is to highlight the role of those who adopted violent methods, such as the rebels of 1857, and the revolutionaries who emerged from the end of the uh, 19th century, or of Azad Hind uh, Fort, of Subhash Bose, thereby downplaying the role of the Congress-led and Gandhi-led nonviolent movement. The rhetoric that accompanies these moves is that the bias in favor of one party and a few individuals is being corrected. Since Mahatma Gandhi is too tall or too dangerous to touch frontally, he is sanitized by being presented as an icon for cleanliness. As you all know, his glasses in India, in India, they adorn the campaign for Swachh Bharat. So much so that some children actually mistook him for a sanitary inspector. There is never any mention of his martyrdom in the cause of communal harmony or of his anti-untouchability campaigns. His greatness has not protected his, his ashram from being modernized, within quotes. And the Charkha too has become a good prop for photo op opportunities for glamorously clad leaders to be seen with foreign dignitaries. So-called fringe elements, within quotes, which include members of parliament, are allowed with impunity to glorify the Mahatma's assassin. Act out scenes of the assassination. This happened in Aligarh. Rajiv Din Saab will be shocked. Run social media campaigns in which the name of the assassin trends on the anniversary of the Mahatma's assassination. As all of you familiar with digital advertising will know, all this is done by spending a lot of money and making things trend. This doesn't happen naturally. So the travesty of somebody being interested in actually paying for on the Mahatma's uh, anniversary of his assassination to get the name of his assassin to trend shows you the extent to which we have fallen. The best, of course, is reserved for the special favorite Jawaharlal Nehru who has been blamed for everything from partition to wrong economic policies, so much so that it has now become a joke in India. So many cartoons come out every day. Whenever there's any major problem, somebody will bring out a cartoon saying, but Nehru was responsible for this. Even the museum which preserved his memory and of the struggle for freedom was sought to be dwarfed by building in its premises a museum to all prime ministers a decidedly novel concept. The new museum has virtually ignored the first prime minister on the plea that there is a separate museum for him. And from what I have heard, I have not yet had the courage to actually go and see for myself. But what I have heard from reliable reports of people who have gone there, the, actually the museum for him has been virtually 
changed or destroyed. That beautiful exhibition on India's freedom struggle is nowhere uh, to be found, for example. In social media, where restraint is either missing or minimal, and flights of fancy have full sway, Nehru is depicted as a westernized, anglophile womanizer, with photographs of him with his sisters and nieces being paraded as proof. He's even said to have <clears throat> a secret Muslim ancestry, as if that by itself condemns him forever. Another favorite tactic is to glorify personalities who are supposed to have been victims of neglect or denied their due by Nehru and his successors. The favorites in this list are Sardar Patel and Subhash Bose, both supposed rivals of Nehru and not his comrades. Their ideological and political differences of opinion are portrayed as personal and factional, and loaded suggestions are made that if only they had been at the helm of affairs rather than Nehru, India would have become a Vishwaguru. Just two days ago, the Prime Minister himself, while inaugurating the new Central Vista, made comments which suggested these things about what would have been if Subhesh Subhash Bose's ideals had been followed after independence. Every once in a while, insinuations that Nehru did not want Bose to return to India and did not make enough efforts to find out the truth about his death are made, with fake letters being circulated that Nehru wrote to the British government calling Bose a war criminal. The same arguments underlie underpin the building of the giant statue of Sadar Patel and inserting chapters on his role in history syllabi, which is all very legitimate, while dropping chapters on Nehru. This has happened in Rajasthan. If only Sardar Patel had become the prime minister after independence, we are told by social media, there would have been no Kashmir problem, no Article 370. They, of course, forget that actually the person who so happened introduced what became Article 70. The 370 in the Constituent Assembly was Sardar Patel. But then whoever cares? Whoever cares for facts nowadays? It is, it is claimed that Patel was unfairly denied the prime ministership, etc., etc. In fact, a book has come out, if you're interested, you can get it online, which lists the 78 blunders of Nehru. And a revised edition has come out, which offers us 129 blunders maybe for a higher price. Such is the barrage of misinformation that consumers of social media today probably believe that Sardar Patel was the founder of the Bharatiya Janata Party. They also probably believe that the Hindu Mahasabha and the RSS led the struggle for freedom, and that Savarkar, Hedgeva, Shama Prasad, Mukherjee, and Deen Dayal Upadhyay were great freedom fighters. If they don't believe it today, they are likely to believe it tomorrow if things go on in the way that they are. Unless, of course, we take active steps to counter what is really fake news. So while in history, Gandhi and Nehru loom large, will continue to loom large in the long run of history. But what's happening in India today is something very different. Now, we need to ask ourselves, why is this attempt at erasure necessary? The answer also is very simple, because it is Gandhiji and Jawaharlal Nehru who, above all, stand in the way of the implementation of the divisive project of Hindu Rashtra or Hindutva, which is the current favorite. To make my point, let me give you some examples from history. I'll begin with Gandhiji's conception of free India. Why is he such an obstacle in their path? Because he was so clear. And you only people will only need to be reminded of the truth for them to move away from Hindu Rashtra. I'll just quote from a speech which he made at the iconic AICC session at Gowalia Tank in Bombay on 8th August 1942, at which he gave the call for Quit India. I quote, those Hindus who like Dr. Munje and Sri Savarkar, believed in the doctrine of the sword, may seek to keep the Muslims under Hindu domination. I do not represent that section. I represent the Congress. The Congress does not believe in the domination of any group or any community. 
It believes in democracy, which includes in its orbit Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Parsis, Jews, every one of the communities inhabiting this vast country. Millions of Muslims in this country come from Hindu stock. How can their homeland be any other than India? The Congress does not belong to any one class or community. It belongs to the whole nation. The Congress is fighting not on behalf of the Hindus, but on behalf of the whole nation, including the minorities. It would hurt me to hear of a single instance of a Muslim being killed by a congressman. In the coming revolution, congressmen will sacrifice their lives in order to protect the Muslim against the Hindus' attack and vice versa. It is a part of their creed. It is one of the essentials of nonviolence. He could not have been clearer. Similarly, responding to a complaint he received from some Congress workers of Delhi about anti-Muslim propaganda being carried out in RSS chakhas, he asserted, this is again around the same time, free India will be no Hindu Raj. It will be Indian Raj based not on the majority of any religious sect or community, but on the representatives of the whole people without distinction of religion. That these were not mere words, but principles for which the Mahatma was willing to and did give up his life is shown by his response to the spate of criminal violence which erupted in 1946. As you all know, he left for Noakhali on 6th of November 1946 and he stayed there for almost four months till the 4th of March 1947 when the most tortuous negotiations for the transfer of power were going on in Delhi and the Congress leaders were begging him to come back and be there. He refused. And it is there that he embarked on what was to be his most amazing or inspiring struggle. There are few images more moving than that of this frail 77-year-old man who could have had all that anyone could want for asking, walking barefoot through the blood-stained villages of Noakhali, where his people had descended to the lowest depths staying only for one night in one village, sleeping in the huts of the poor, searching for an answer, crucifying his flesh in yet another experiment with truth. We can also never forget that he was martyred to the cause of secularism. The Hindu communal group led by Savarkar, which planned the conspiracy and the assassin who gunned him down, believed that he was the chief obstacle to the setting up of a Hindu Rashtra after partition. And they were right. His commitment to secularism was absolute. On 17th August 1947, two days after Indian independence, he made the following statement. If a minority in India, minority on the score of its religious profession, was made to feel small on that account, he could only say that this India was not the India of his dreams. In the India for whose fashioning he had worked all his life, every man enjoyed equality of status, whatever his religion was. I quote him again, one simple sentence, he said again, the state was bound to be wholly secular. As we all know, his martyrdom had a cathartic effect on the whole nation, ravaged by sectarian strife, which came to an abrupt halt. Many of those who had indulged in communal violence felt guilt and remorse and held themselves responsible for the tragedy. In his death, he gave a new lease of life to the newborn nation, which remained free of communal strife for almost a decade after his death. Jawaharlal Nehru's name is almost synonymous with the idea of a secular India. His faith in and commitment to the secular ideal was absolute as was as absolute as his belief in freedom, democracy, and equity. He adhered to it during the long years of the epic struggle for independence in the wake of the colonial policy of divide and rule. He also contributed hugely to its becoming a constitutional value, not only by ensuring that it was formally embodied in the constitution, but even more by his valiant and successful struggle against the communal forces in the crucial years before and after independence. Your Secularism last... could be enshrined in the pages of the constitution only because the shrill demand for a Hindu Rashtra was beaten back in the streets and the ballot boxes. 
With the coming of independence in August 47, his resolve became even firmer. In a broadcast on All India Radio, four days after independence, he said, our state is not a communal state, but a democratic state in which every citizen has equal rights and the government is determined to protect these rights. After Gandhiji's martyrdom, Nehru converted the first general election campaign into a movement against communalism. He traveled nearly 40,000 kilometers and addressed an estimated 35 million people or one tenth of India's population. The result was that the communal parties, the Hindu Mahasabha, the newly formed Jansang and the Ram Raja Parishad won between them only 10 Lok Sabha seats in a house of 489. Mm -hmm. And they polled 6% of the vote. Are you I finished. I finished. Sorry. sorry. History, deserves, history deserves better than to be reduced to a handmaiden of divisive politics. That too, in the name of nationalism, as we are witnessing today. Thank you. Sorry for reminding, uh, but you know we have to come, come you know, put the yeah. time frame. So now yeah, I think I kept to the time as far yeah. as I could see. Uh, now your husband's turn, so he he is going to um, take over and chop some time <laughs> accordingly. Yaditya ji. No, it is. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I too would like to start by thanking Ravi Saab and the Washington DC diaspora group for relentlessly week after week. Aditya, just if you can come close to the mic or something, the audio. No, just... I think you are on mute and your voice is coming through your spouse's mic. Unmute yourself. Thank you. As uh, to begin with, again, like to thank Razi Saab and the Washington Diaspora Group. Uh, for, as I said, relentlessly week after week, continuing this dialogue in these dark times when alternative voices are sought to be drowned out by widespread uh, propaganda of the lowest level. Thanks also for inviting me to participate in this counter-narrative that you are trying to create. Part of the propaganda, as was just now described by Professor Madhula Mukherjee, is to demonize Nehru, portray him as the evil which caused almost all of India's problems. The attempt is to erase him from history. In this context, my talk will be to highlight Nehru's critical role in the making of some of the crucial aspects of modern India. When we talk, this, the topic given to me was temples of modern Nehru and the temples of modern India. When we talk of Nehru's temples of modern India, we are talking of his vision of the future independent India. While talking about his vision and his attempt, it is necessary to remember what the economists call the initial conditions from which he had to start <clears throat> at independence. The poet Ravindranath Tagore, shortly before his death in 1941, had very graphically anticipated these initial conditions. He said, when the wheels of fate will someday compel the English to give up their Indian empire, what kind of India will they leave behind? What stark misery? When the stream of their centuries administration runs dry at last, what a waste of mud and filth will they leave behind them? 
the mud, the mud and filth that we inherited at independence was a famine-ridden country. Three million had died just four years before independence, a famine. A country where the per capita income as well as the food grain output was falling annually by 0.22 and 1.14% 1 1 for three decades before independence, where the life expectancy, average life expectancy of Indians was less than 30 years. So you can imagine that uh, the, uh, what the average life expectancy would be for the poor. 84% of Indians were illiterate, 92% women were illiterate. And if you add to that what the British left behind, which was alluded to, uh, a severely divided uh, country with millions dead and rendered homeless in religious communal carnage that happened under colonial tutelage. It was indeed a gigantic task to try to raise India from this mud and filth, and the responsibility fell to a great extent on Jawaharlal Nehru, as the Mahatma had been assassinated by a Hindu communal uh, fanatic, and uh, Sadar Patel had died in 1950. Nehru launched a multi-pronged strategy to lift India out of this morass, which in fact became an example for numerous other countries which became independent after the Second World War. The temples of modern India that he was talking about was part of the strategy to lift India out of this mud and filth. Nehru understood that at independence, India was in a virtual neo-colonial condition, politically independent, but economically dependent on the same imperial uh, world from which it had got itself independence, political independence. At independence, nearly 100% of the machinery required to make any investment, which means to make, have any growth, had to be independent, had to be imported, excuse me. 95% of even machine tools, that is your pliers and wrenches, had to be imported. The dependence on technology was even greater. That is, even if you were, that is because the area of science and technology had been kept uh, consciously barren as, as much as possible by the colonial state. So the result was that even if you bought the machines with the resources that you have, there was no technical manpower to run it. That is what was the situation at independence. It is to meet this challenge, which was critical for India to gain real independence or sovereignty, that Nehru created the what he called the temples of modern India. The steel plants, the heavy machinery uh, industry, the capital good industry, the dams, the fertilizer factories, etc., as well as the IITs, the AIMS, the National Physical Laboratory, the National Chemical Laboratory, the uh, the Space Research Institute, the CSI, I just name it, almost any institution that you know of, hmm, was conceived of in the 1950s and evolved in the Nehruvian era. His idea of temples of modern India was certainly not to build a Hindu temple by, as the Supreme Court said, committing the criminal act of destroying a mosque. That was not going to be Nehru's uh, temples of modern India. Nehru, through the Nehru Mahanubi strategy, which was implemented from the second plan onwards, made a tremendous effort to build these capital good industries, making use of the public sector. So all the major public sectors, the, the Navaratnas as they are called, the HMT, the BHEL, the Bharat Earth Movers, the Hindustan Aeronautics, Indian telephone industries, Sindhi fertilizers, Dilai, Bokaro steel plants. I mean, that. That, I mean, I can't spend more time uh, listing this. All the major uh, public sector enterprises, which are being, of course, consciously destroyed today, hmm, uh, shockingly, even 
the role of the public sector in health and education is being destroyed today was uh, but that apart what nehru did was to create these and not with the help of that dramatically alter the situation for india from 100% dependence on imported machinery by 96 by 1960 only 43% had to be imported and by 1974 only 9% that is india could achieve its own growth on the basis of 91% of what was required by producing it within the country a great achievement in unstructuring colonial colonialism this is what made possible an independent foreign policy this is what enabled india to lead 100 countries more than 100 countries in the non aligned movement to a position where they refused to be junior partners to either of the superpowers nehru also anticipated brilliantly the knowledge revolution ensuring that this was one bus india was not going to miss like it did the first and the second industrial revolution the the building of the numerous scientific institutions mentioned that i mentioned earlier was made possible by an expenditure in science and technology which increased several hundred times to give you one statistic from rupees 10 million in 1949 to 4.5 billion by mid 1970s increasing the stock of india's scientific and scientific and technical manpower more than 12 times from 190000 to 2.23 million over roughly this period if india is able to participate in the information revolution occurring globally it is because of the efforts made over the past decades the leading sector of the indian economy today which produces more than 50% of india's gdp is the service sector which is the a product of the huge investment made in the knowledge sector in the past these achievements that i have just now said have not happened despite nehru as is claimed today they have happened by riding on the shoulders of the impetus that was created by nehru if anything the danger that we see is what we are currently doing to the institutions of higher education and to the scientific temper people holding the highest offices speak today often at science congresses and engineering fairs about arjun the heroic character from the epic mahabharat having nuclear tipped arrows they talk of the god ganesha getting his elephant snout through plastic surgery in other words they are announcing the burial of the scientific temper universities which nehru said stand for i'm quoting him stand for humanism for tolerance for reason for adventure of ideas and the search for truth today witness as we do in our my own university jnu and several other universities like jamia and I, many other top universities in this country uh, where you see the silencing of independent voices through brutal attacks police lati charges arrest of students intimidation of faculty dictating believe you me dictating who can or cannot be invited to a conference to speak is being dictated now hmm? attempt to change syllabi etc etc i mean there could not be a better recipe for destroying any institution of higher education in any area from the social sciences to the pure sciences Nehru's temple temples of modern India are clearly under siege including the parliament and other legislatures which institutions which Nehru held in the greatest esteem sitting through every session of the parliament listening to arguing with and encouraging the opposition to speak up as he believed that there is no democracy without a vibrant opposition and what we are witnessing witnessing today is opposition members of the legislatures being shamefully openly bought and sold 
or bullied by using the state machinery into coming into the fold of the ruling party. The slogan is opposition mukt, Congress mukt, Andolan Jeevi mukt, Andolan Jeevi meaning people who agitate, hmm? who are now being described as parasites, that is Parjeevi. Hmm? So we want them to be, India to be mukt of that, left liberal intellectual mukt, Lutens Delhi mukt, and so on uh, is the phrase. Hmm? So the erasure that we are now seeing the attempt that Madhula was talking about, the attempt at the erasure of what Gandhi and Nehru uh, stood for appears to be, uh, the attempt seems to be growing on a massive scale and it has to be stopped if we have, and we have to go back to the vision that they created if we want to save the secular, democratic, modern idea of India. Thank you so much. Wonderfully said, Aditya ji. Now we invite Professor Sucheta Mahajan to conclude the session before we move to question and answer. Uh, Sucheta ji, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, my thanks, first of all, to Razi Saab for inviting me for this panel on independence and partition. Uh, also, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of my former student, Dr. Anshu Saluja, uh, to this talk. Um, the first question I would like to raise is, why am I speaking only on partition and not on independence? Part of the reason is that when India turned 50 in 1997, a view emerged that we had mostly been celebrating independence for about 50 years. Whereas we should have been mourning the tragedy of partition. This was a view put forward by the eminent sociologist Ashish Nandi. Accordingly, following this, the last 25 years have seen a focus on partition at the expense, I would say, of a focus on independence. And today, partition studies vastly outnumber the writings on independence if we look at the new works which are coming out. While the contribution of partition studies or talks like this on partition are invaluable in drawing attention to what was a colossal tragedy, and believe me, this is not only an academic statement I'm making, but I come from a family where my parents had made the trek from Lahore to New Delhi in 1947. And large, many members of our family were also affected in a huge way by partition. And we grew up in a refugee colony. I believe that this present preoccupation with partition sometimes tends to eclipse the hugely important and indeed revolutionary nature of the transformation that marked the end of colonialism in 1947. It is indeed ironic that today we find the critiques of colonialism are coming more in public, popular books and in public debates by books by Shashi Tharoor and others rather than academic writings on the subject. Having made that point, it was very important to have made that caveat, let me turn to partition. Now, the subject on which Razi Sahab has asked me to speak is the impact of partition on the politics and society of present day India. Now, there is no doubt about it that partition continues to have an impact on politics, on society, on the fashioning of communities, on our relations with our neighbors and closer home, on our divided selves. I want you to think about 
what I'm seeing here for one minute. Partition remains a reference point for every subsequent major episode of communal violence or divide that has taken place since 1947. Let me take the example of 1984, anti-Sikh riots, in which in Delhi alone, some 3,000 people were killed. I was part of a civil society group at that time as a student, and we used to go to the areas, one of the areas, and work among the Sikh widows. And do you know what they referred to, what had happened to them as? They use the word Dusra Batwara. Again, many years later, when the Gujarat riots took place, people who were observers there and helping people there also brought this to our attention that the people who suffered were comparing what had happened to them to partition. So, Partition is there in the psyche of our people when it comes to the communal divide and uh, the communal violence in particular. One thing I want all of you to remember is that this impact of partition in terms of communalizing our polity and our society, which I'm going to speak about in a minute. Friends, do remember one thing. This is all in recent decades. Do remember that the early years of our republic were marked by a strong secular state and polity. In fact, the leadership of the freedom struggle set an example of how to deal with the communal challenge. Right after independence and partition, after the tragic assassination of the Mahatma by a Hindu communal activist who saw him as an obstacle in their pursuit of a Hindu state, both Nehru and Patel and other congressmen in the government came down very heavily on the Hindu communal forces, on the RSS, on the Hindu Mahasabha. There was an understanding that Hindu communalism was a serious threat to the secular fabric of the nascent Indian nation. And this challenge had to be met. So what am I saying? My point here is, a slightly complex point. That is, while it is important to remember that the prevalent communal divide and polarization that we find in our country today, while this is partly an unfortunate legacy of partition, we must remember that this did not naturally flow from the massacres which accompanied partition. It's very important to remember this disjunction because in a lot of writings, there is a kind of sweeping statement where it seems as if, you know, we talk, people talk about partition and then about the communalization uh, afterwards. As Professor Nidula Mukherjee drew our attention to, Gandhi's assassination shocked the nation and in fact turned them, turned our people against communal forces for a significant number of years. But, and this is a big but, communalism grew slowly and steadily over time. And by the 1980s, communal forces of various hues became viable political forces. And from the Hindu communal side, they even were able to stake a claim to form governments which in recent years have been showing their true fascist colors. To go back to the how partition has been used or rather misused in the discourse and policies 
of post-colonial regimes, particularly in recent years. Just recall the huge buildup of the security establishment over the last many decades, playing on the fear of the average citizen. One day we woke up and we found full page advertisements in the newspapers where a barbed wire was drawn across the page and there was the sentence below, the border is at your door. Fear in this kind of discourse is widespread and hostility is something which is fostered. We all know that partition and subsequent hostilities between India and Pakistan have been used as a basis, as an excuse, as a cover to build up a huge military establishment on both sides. You will all remember the way the Kargil war was drummed up to win elections, to build up or to have this, what we call a mask of nationalism, to cover what is the reality of communalism. And of course, the way in which Kashmir is made to feed into an anti-Pakistan and by implication, an anti-Muslim rhetoric is there for all to, of us to see in recent years. I would only draw your attention to the recent naming of a day as the Partition Horrors Remembrance Day, supposedly being something which was meant to honor uh, or record the um, trauma of the survivors of partition. But actually, if you look behind it, a very pernicious agenda, very pointedly, this day is on 14th August, which as we all know, was the day of Pakistan's independence. Looking at the role of the political parties and particularly the Hindu communal parties 75 years after 1947, what do we find? The image of partition which is propagated in social media, in the press, is not suffering. It is that of the vivisection of Bharat Mata, of Mother India. When unity of the country is spoken about, it is not spoken about in the Nehruvian and Congress idea of unity in diversity, no. Today, the idea that is popularized is that of a Khand Bharat, a Bharat which will include the territory of Pakistan because it is going to go right up to the Sindhu River. What is the image of the Muslim community which is popularized by the present regimes? The Muslim is portrayed of, as one who is loyal to Pakistan. He roots for the Pakistani cricket team, not for our cricket team. He flies the flag of Pakistan, it is alleged. Any which way that it, he can be dubbed as anti-national. Actions which are taken against Muslims, very pernicious actions in recent years. Lynching and worse is legitimized in the public discourse on the basis of their alleged loyalties to other countries. Obviously, they're talking about Pakistan. The act, the Citizenship Amendment Act, the CA, was legitimized on this very basis. The idea that the Indian state would give special status to Hindus and Sikhs and other non-Muslims resident in Pakistan and Bangladesh. So Afghani Sikhs are ours. They belong to India. They are welcome. Assamese Muslims from Bangladesh? No, they are not welcome. Afghani Sikhs are, have a right to return. So the discourse of Ghar Vapsi, the return home, which we have seen in conversion and in other discourses, in other theaters, we find here too. Coming to the second part of my talk, what then is to be done? At a political level, I'm sure all of you agree that we must counter in whatever way we can the serious threat that is posed today to the values of our freedom struggle, 
democracy, secularism, etc., which the Indian people have made such sacrifices for and which our nation state has nurtured in the last 75 years. These values are threatened by communal forces. And these communal forces, which are now in power, they so clearly have a problem with the idea of India, which was projected and which was given shape to uh, in the anti-colonial struggle. So that's the first point that we need to do. Legacies don't just live forever. You need to renew your vows. We need to renew our vows to the values of our freedom struggle. The second thing we need to do, and this is my last point, is that coming to the level of the ordinary people, to civil society, to citizens, and this is something I really would like you to think about because this is not coming from an academic orientation, but at a very different whole human level that I'm trying to connect. We need to personally and publicly recognize the suffering and trauma of the survivors of partition. This is why the recovery of the voices of the survivors of partition has to become a major initiative today. Imagine a situation where the major initiative on this is coming from a Berkeley-based 1947 partition archive where Gunita Bhalla is doing this for the last 10 years, but I can't think of anything comparable at that level on um, in India or in Pakistan or Bangladesh and other countries. It's very important to record the stories of partition across countries. Why is this important? Not just because people are dying. It is for our present. Friends, we have lived with a certain history of conflict, divide, othering. The stories that we will collect and which are being collected could also give us another narrative, that of men and women whose actions epitomized sympathy and sacrifice for the other community. The eminent political scientist and thinker Javed Alam reminded us some years ago, he said, for every instance of killing that we hear of, He's talking about partition. We also hear of somebody's attempt to help, to rescue, somebody giving a shoulder to lean on. We know these names. We have to spread the net. By recovering these positive voices of the survivors, I'm raising a question. Is it possible to enable the emergence of narratives which can help us Take another look at our divided selves, our othered societies, our enemy neighbors, in ways which will allow for living together within our countries and in our regions, or even living together separately. Let me remind you that such initiatives have worked to a large extent in South Africa, in the Reconciliation Commission, or even in Ireland, where oral history initiatives have been undertaken by civil society groups and even jails and police uh, archives in a process which is beautifully described as healing through remembering. The issue which comes up here in this context among oral historians and memory workers is one of silence and remembering. We know Urvashi Butalia's book, The Other Side of Silence, which epitomized the view that memories had been suppressed by the state and the community, and the task of the historian was to bring them to light. This model came to us from Holocaust studies. In the Holocaust paradigm, the, the 
entire perspective was we must give our testimony we must bear witness that was the title of eli wiesel's very famous book he was the nobel prize winner if you recall that we must remember so that history is never repeated again however my experience with interviewees when i've done my research in the oral history of partition has made me question the imperative of remembering in my experience there was a more nuanced reality sometimes a survivor could choose to be silent silence could be a sanctuary which was chosen by a survivor who was traumatized so what do we do it's best then that we see remembering and forgetting as a kind of dialectic that i feel would be a better approach to the issue and here i want to end with a reference to 1882 more than 100 years ago a very famous historian who was also a philologist in france by the name of ernest renan he wrote a small tract qu'est-ce a nation in french translated in english as what is a nation and interestingly this tract continues to have relevance today and is cited today in studies of nationalism what does renan say in a country that is france which his history is torn by the divide between catholics and protestants and divide between the north and the south what does he suggest to his fellow frenchmen he says forget about the interreligious massacres what we would call communal massacres of the medieval period if you want to hang together as a country friends for us in south asia looking to recover voices to harness memory to the task of bringing communities and countries together so that we can move on behind this terrible bind or that partition has put us in i feel this might be useful advice that we could adapt to our own specific needs thank you so much for your patience wonderful and very very nice suggestion and actually there are some individuals here who are trying to do this cross border uh, reconciliation effort so let's move on to and just the announcement for the coming week in the same length i think it is somewhere overlapping uh, professor muqtadar khan from university of delaware uh, and dr amirullah khan from india uh, they are uh, going to talk about two level games of hindu muslim dialogue in india and this two level game uh, is defined by professor muqtadar khan as one game or one dialogue between hindus muslims and the second within muslim community itself that the muslims themselves have to do a reform kind of dialogue whether something is wrong with us or everything is very right within us so this is a very challenging topic uh, now we move to a question and answer session uh, today we don't have our usual mod, uh, moderator rather the challenge falls on our host uh, mirza faisal beg and he is going to take uh, questions and please be brief in responding and if later on if there is a lack of question then people can make some comments in those comments also they should be very brief so that others can get time to uh, faisal ji so please raise your digital hand uh, again just to reiterate keep your questions brief and i will request uh, our panelists to keep their answers also brief uh, i have allowed people to unmute themselves and you can also um, uh, turn on your camera if you would like uh, first question goes to mr rudranshu singh good evening ma'am and good evening sir 
And I would like to ask you that uh, were the professors of history caught napping that we were unable to detect the traits of communalism in Indian society? Like, for example, in Vajpayee's government also, there was a nonsensical attempt to demonize Gandhi that uh, Gandhiji was jealous of Bhagat Singh. <coughs> Rather, Gandhiji was behind his hanging. He did blah, blah, blah. A film called The Legend of Bhagat Singh was made and all kinds of tomfoolery that was going on. <coughs> Were the liberals slow to react? <coughs> Please, anybody uh, who wants unmute, to... Unmute yourself unmute, before you answer that. Unmute yourself. Yeah, yes. I said, uh, I was saying that I don't think that's true because Indian historians have been very active in refuting the whole communal onslaught on history. They've been right from 1977 when the first Janata government came to power and the first attack on history books, secular history books started. Indian historians even then conducted a nationwide campaign on the issue. And when the Bajpai government came, the same thing happened. They started interfering with the textbooks. First attack on, again, CRT textbooks written by Professor Romila Thapad and Professor Satish Chandra, Bipin Chandra, R.S. Sharma. So again, historians were very active individually. We at JNU, as a group, we immediately refuted it. We brought out pamphlets. We conducted seminars uh, at personal expense where everybody would come and contribute uh, <clears throat> to, to the costs. And we not only that, the Indian History Congress was very active, immediately took up these issues. It, uh, it appointed a committee which brought out a whole book of which Professor Ipanabi, Suvira Deswal and Aditya Mukherjee were members, which pointed out all the mistakes and the distortions in the NCRT books, which then made it possible after the Bajpai government went for the new regime to uh, take out those books and bring in new books. So I would say that historians have been the most active among the intellectuals and scholars in India in countering the communal narrative. Thank you. Uh, next question is from uh, Esar Saab, and after that, uh, Nazir Saab. Yeah, um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to listen from across the border from India. Wonderful presentations. Uh, Suchita Mahajan ji, uh, she talked about the recent communal divide and even conflicts. I would go back to 1947 and I would say uh, the foundation was laid right there. Don't you think it was criminal on part of Hindu and Muslim leadership who couldn't stop the assassination and riots in which I think about million people died? And when you compared it to South Africa, uh, Mandela comes up as a more uh, higher and better leader who stopped the killings and everything in South Africa. So do you think if it was criminal to both uh, Hindu and Muslim leadership, Liaquat, Jinnah, and Nehru and uh, uh, Gandhi both, who couldn't come up and shed their communal uh, boundaries and allowed this? What do you think? You know, uh, thank you for the question. I would, you know, this is a, this is something I would normally have spoken about. Uh, you know, about why the Congress and Gandhiji and Jinnah uh, accepted partition. Why they were in a situation where they had no options. But then Razi Sahab asked me to speak on the impact of partition today. Uh, so thank you for asking this question. So you, that are I can free, ask you are free to explain <laughs> further. We <laughs> have time, yeah. enough time. Yeah. You can I'm, I'm, just, I'm just coming to that, Razi Sahab. Uh, firstly, if there is any 
somebody mm. who is guilty of criminal behavior or criminal neglect or criminal actions uh, it is the colonial power it is the responsibility is squarely to be laid at the door of mount batten and his entire team the district officers in the countryside who were completely callous and indifferent to the carnage we have so many and it is before i say anything else i think i feel very sorry uh it's not anything to do with the questionnaire so please don't misunderstand me but i feel very sad that 75 years after independence um we in india and pakistan are still considering ourselves responsible that is uh, our leaders responsible for partition and what happened after uh, the colonial power which imposed partition on us don't forget that it was an award there was no agreement it was announced by mount batten the only option that jinnah saab and nehru had was to accept it or reject it if they had rejected it i'm talking about 3 june or rather the evening of 2nd june 1947 when they go on the radio all india radio and accept it the situation in the country for almost 11 months since what is known as the great calcutta killings since 16th august had been what historians anita inder singh and others have described as civil war these were not normal communal riots of where there was stabbing or you know something here or something there no this was civil war and this was reign of terror what professor mukherji referred to noakali noakali was a reign of terror it was not a communal riot multan um where i mean where punjab you are speaking from pakistan i think sorry rawal pindi the riots which started in uh, in march there is a there is um, bhisham sani ji who is one of our subcontinent's great writers as you all know him uh, his brother was balraj sani another great artist and intellectual and actor bhisham sani wrote a book called tamas which was i mean iska matlab kya hai ila Sorry about that. Carry on. No, nee. he wrote a book which was made into a tele serial, which where he has an episode, and then interestingly, I found that same episode uh, in Transfer of Power Volumes, which are the pub, you know, the official classified papers published by the His Majesty's government from 1972 onwards, classified documents. That is, there are. the instance in which the congress and muslim league leaders of rawalpindi <clears throat> go to the district officer to the D- the dc and they beg him his name is richard in the book and they say mm-hmm. please have a flag march you know there are riots which have broken out in the army and his wife also says why are you not sending the troops and he says something which you know was shocking in the book and it's there in the transfer of power volumes jay prakash narayan was told the same thing they when the indians when when people went to the district office official they said you asked for this you wanted to be independent now you can stew in your own juice these were words which were actually used so to come back to your the main question i mean i was giving examples but to come back to it at a more national level um the congress and the muslim league none of them had political power they were the interim government was very weak you know that they did not have any state force there was no option at that time but to accept 
And this is what Gandhiji said, let the British go, they are the mischief makers. Don't accept partition in your heart. Don't, tomorrow is another day. The big brother and the small younger brother will sit down and they will make a division as, you know, which will be according to everybody's requirements and needs. So that was the context. We must stop considering ourselves, Hindus and Muslims, or our leaders, whether it's Gandhi, Nehru, Jinnah, Liyaka, they were not responsible for partition. Not at all. The massacres which followed, yes, the British left, but after that, there was nothing that anybody could have done. And I think on both sides, they went out of their way, both of the governments, to try and stop, but it was too late. Thank you. No. Uh, yeah, sorry. Nazir, next, uh, please keep it brief. Yes. Uh, yeah, sure. I'd like to focus on the idea of Hindutva. It's a historical truism that every idea has within it the seeds for its growth and its destruction. So when we look at Hindutva, it seems to me some of the elements that give it strength are that it wraps itself in a cloak of false religiosity and nationalism. And its weaknesses are also obvious. It's allergy to historical truth. It is extreme. It is racist. It defines itself not in terms of itself, but in contradiction to the other. Just a side comment in terms of historical truth. The other side, specifically the Indian National Congress after independence, somehow neglected to give enough credence to the contributions of INA to the struggle for independence. And secondly, the role played by Gandhi, Jinnah, Nehru, and Pat Patel in the events leading to partition are substantial. They have to be accepted historically. Nehru's greatness was that he brought India into the age of reason after independence. In any case, I would like to invite our distinguished panel to make a few comments on the fault lines within Hindutva. So, so Chitta, you, may, you may want to take the INA question first. Yeah, I was just going to say on the INA question, um, there, is, uh, there is absolutely no truth in this that uh, the Congress or the Indian state has been uh, neglected. They have neglected the role of the INA in any which way. Uh, let me take you back. Just one very yeah, quick answer that I'm going to give you. Uh, both Nehru, Jawala Nehru, put on his lawyer's robes after maybe 30 odd years to fight the case of Segal, Shanavas, and Dillo, the big three who were put on trial at the Red Fort in 1945 for alleged brut brutalities. Katju, Gulabhai Desai, the entire galaxy of Congress leaders who were many of them, as you know, very brilliant lawyers before they became nationalist leaders. Uh, they were all part of that. Not just that, there was for, there was an INA relief committee which was set up by the Congress, which took up the issue of the demobilized INA men, largely in Punjab, but also in many other areas of the country. And again, it is a canard. I know you are not raising this, but let me mention it nevertheless. The Congress governments in the provinces employed INA men in the police force. It is very often said that, you know, uh, INA people weren't taken back in the army, etc., etc., as proof that the Congress government, and it is 
some of our own historians have said this also but this is absolutely not true there were various reasons why one could understand from the point of view of a new, newly independent state embarking on uh, you know a new path why uh, they could not be taken back into the army but short of that uh, everything else was done as far as their rehabilitation was concerned including political rehabilitation and some of the very important leaders of the ina i'm not talking about Swa subhash bose as you know bose had unfortunately uh, died in the plane crash in august 1945 but colonel niranjan singh gill was gandhi ji's right hand man he went to noakali but he was not allowed to be there and then he went to bihar and he played a very crucial role there um, with the riots and the sufferers and uh, mohan singh and others you know and after independence also they remained with the important nationalist party but on the question of uh, hindutva uh, i'm sure that uh, mridula or aditya would like to um, answer that yeah. no i don't have any disagreement with what uh, has been said about you know the being the nature of contradictions within uh, hindutva which uh, Uh, hopefully, in the long run, will lead to its demise. We hope the long run will not be too long. And uh, there's all that's also the reason that I personally do not believe <clears throat> that it's an idea that has actually gripped the minds of the majority of the Indian people. I think there are other reasons also for why the uh, BJP is in power today. There are other reasons why things are happening the way they are. to imagine that the vast majority of the indian people actually believe in hindutva would be like giving up the battle all together they do not because there is a i believe that there is a basic uh in indian civilization and culture and in the political uh, uh understanding of the people of india including its poorest uh, people because of the way they have lived their lives now uh there is a resistance to these kind of ideas and their actual beliefs are very different from the idea of hindutva as it was articulated by savarkar and then propagated by gulwalkar and then practiced in various kinds of ways where the core of it is anti muslim in fact i don't believe hindutva has anything else to it but anti muslim that is its core and that is its substance beyond that it's nothing let me also say that there's no religiosity in hindutva savarkar was very clear he said it in so many words he said i am not concerned about hinduism i am concerned about hindus as a political group i want to make them into a political community he was a political man not a religious man in fact as you know he was at least an agnostic if not an atheist you know so just like jinnah sahab <laughs> you know that is the irony uh, of our history that religious uh, people like molana azad then mahatma gandhi were the greatest secularists and the non religious people were the communalists so that is why we conclude also that religion has nothing to do with communalism it's communalism that misuses religion for political ends but there is actually no intrinsic or inherent <laughs> link between religion and communalism i would say with gandhi communalism is the antithesis of true religion thank you uh, uh, mr dalip uh, do you want to ask your question quickly and after that will be satinath <clears throat> am i audible yes yeah salam in kalab now my question the first question you know you have asked me i can ask only two questions Okay now first question goes to uh, professor suchitra mahajan now this is a combination was it not the vocalization of communal shrieks by hindu gentle folk that laid the foundation of partition was partition a conscious betrayal by congress and rss leadership combined this is my first question that goes to uh, uh, professor suchitra mahajan Dilip, sir, you have only one question, and you did it. That's fine. Later on, we can see. You don't ask second question. Oh no, that's not being fair. Say, hey. that's not being fair. Now we are talking about partition, and you here. 
ನಾನು do you want the answer now or after the second question no 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 please go ahead it looks like he has muted himself so go ahead answer the question no, there is only one question it is it is connected all right okay thank you so please go ahead someone asks some questions why can't i ask questions instead of like this nobody answer they will not answer this so yes, why sir. can't i okay. professor chitra go ahead answer the question and then we'll take up uh, next questions huh Hello. Um, I I'm afraid I don't agree at all with your uh, yes. characterization. Um you are also lumping together the Hindu communal forces or groups or organizations like RSS and Congress which I think is a total travesty if I may call it that. Uh the Congress was a secular nationalist party and with secular nationalist politics. and the rss politics was the politics of not just communalism but by 1947 it was the politics of extreme communal hatred um and so we cannot at, at all uh, put them in the same group uh, number 2 um i know that this view of what you are asking has been put forward this view that the hindu what you're calling gentle folk or bhadra lok uh it the word has been used for bengal so there are scholars from cambridge um joya chatterji is one of them who has argued this in fact uh, you are putting across her views very well but uh, they have absolutely no basis they are this is and similarly yeah. the same argument has been made for punjab by yeah. ayesha jalal student neeti nair who in fact has gone as far back i think it's ridiculous has gone as far back as 1924 to lala lajpat rai's addresses some very important political addresses to the nation that he has from 1924 where she is claiming that in that that the i mean she is using that to claim that it was the hindu communal groups and lajpat rai supposedly being one of them which i contest also that they were behind partition look i think this is a kind of very pernicious history which has come out of cambridge school it is a second or third generation cambridge school when the historians from cambridge uh, starting with anil seal and others they belittled our national movement calling it namirite politics calling it a cock fight when they could not succeed next second generation came and said there's nothing called the nation there's nothing called all india politics it's all about locality and the province that was the second attempt to belittle the freedom struggle and the third this is the third attempt in a different shape to deny the legitimacy of indian nationalism and to club indian nationalism with hindu communalism i think that this is a as i said a total travesty and we i'm only mentioning cambridge school as i earlier mentioned the colonial state earlier about responsibility for partition friends we must understand in south asia or washington across the board this is a sinister conspiracy to keep us divided that is the british divided and ruled for 200 more years that conspiracy in a different form now it takes the form of academic conspiracy that means the writings yes, now which come out also push the same idea and they put they pit hindus and muslims and more important today pakistani scholars and indian scholars against each other thank you but so sir so we must not fall for this at all yeah mr satinath you are next and after that g ramachandran 
Okay, I have uh, put my question, uh, sort of comments in the chat box and I'll read them to you. Um, the Kashmir policy is at the core of Hindu-Muslim divide. I think uh, um, it may not very much look like that, but it is. Um, Sheikh Abdullah very much wanted the plebiscite and he hoped that Kashmir will become an independent country and um, they should have been conceded. It would have been like Nepal, a friendly country of Muslims. Secondly, um, the education policy right from the beginning was skewed very much towards just educating the the, uh, the elites, the the upper caste elites, rather than the whole the whole country, like China. China had put educating the the whole. Can you, can you come to your question, please, quickly? Uh, sorry, there are a lot of people who want to ask questions. So sorry to rush you in. Okay, there is one question particularly. Uh, yeah. Separate electorate had remained at the center of demand for the desire of minority em empowerment of both the Muslims as well as the lower caste, the scheduled caste. And um, somehow, somehow they did not pay any, any attention to the rep proportional representation system of election, which had already spread to a good, uh, you know, some 30, 40 countries around the world. And uh, I, if anybody knows how come uh, this went out of, uh, nobody paid any attention to that system. And uh, at Thank last, you. I feel that uh, the you. reason- let's, let's keep it short here, please. Uh, there, there's too many people. Uh, can you answer this question? Who will take this question? Uh, I think the first question uh, was relating to Kashmir. He said that the heart of the communal problem is the Kashmir issue. I firstly, that's not true. Communal problem has started with the British divide and rule policy in the a decade and a half after the revolt of 1857. Uh, Kashmir issue was not there till a century later. So to say that uh, this problem is because of the Kashmir issue is not correct. Uh, because as I said, it's a long history. I don't want to go into that. Uh, by 1907, Muslim League had been formed and Hindu Mahasabha was there a little later and the story went on. And so Kashmir issue emerges after independence, really with the question of the integration of the states. And uh, it's a complicated story, very difficult to for me to do justice to it here, but just one issue which you have taken up. Uh, firstly, Sheikh Abdullah very much was for integration with India. In fact, when the when the Indian government decided to uh, integrate Kashmir, and they were waiting, they were not forcing anybody. The Maharaja, as you know, was playing a waiting game. So between August and October, he was still holding out. Uh, when Jawaharlal Nehru as Prime Minister, Sadat Patel as Home Minister, Interior Minister, India, the States Minister, they all finally decided to have the integration. It was after the Maharaja came around, but more than anything else, it was Sheikh Abdullah who was pro-India. Sheikh Abdullah was the leader of the National Conference, which was a secular body, secular political body. And they had been very close to the Congress and particularly Jawaharlal Nehru in the years before independence. So this is not true. Later differences developed, that's a different story. Just one point I'll take up on the plebiscite, which you raised, because it's again one of those things comes up again and again, and Nehru is blamed for agreeing to plebiscite and doing, going back on it. It's actually very clear, Nehru had agreed to plebiscite on certain conditions. He had said the Pakistani army must retreat. There must be no armed presence over there for plebiscite to be held. That condition was never fulfilled. That is the promise he had given. And after that, life took over. Elections were held in Kashmir. Their own constitution was formed. So you couldn't keep going back and saying, hold a plebiscite. Now, plebiscite about what? 
so it's a complicated story but these are some of the usual things which i have said but it is i do not agree that heart of it is that if today of course we should solve the kashmir problem of course there is a lot of issues with abolition of article 370 and this and that and kashmir problem is a issue used as a whip by communal forces to beat muslims in india with always questioning the loyalty that is not the same thing as saying it is the cause of the communal problem thank you uh, mr ramachandran and after yeah. that will be uh, abdul jabbar tariq bhai and shahid bhai thank you i am dr ramachandran professor of political science retired principal from mumbai university the question is to professor aditya mukherjee as, as an eurovian having done a phd on pandit nehru his contribution to world peace was my phd degree uh, so much is happening why is that the civil society the intellectuals are silent they don't feel affected not concerned about the damage that is done under the present regime i can't just understand the rise of hindutva fanaticism you know the majoritarian communal uh, bigotry why is that uh, media every uh, probable agency the is silent over uh, obvious that they are endorsing everything that modi does there is no fault in it thank you thank you you see I, again i would have to respectfully disagree with you uh, civil society is not silent hmm? ravi sahab is raza sahab is speaking up ravi sena yeah. sahab i can see he right. organizes voices yeah. against uh, subhash ghatade is there there are dozens of civil society groups there is a civil society group called anhad which made 50 videos hmm? 50 hmm? you know critiquing the present regime from all disciplines of uh, that you can imagine from the political science to science to history to everything all issues were raised it is that we, the institutions of this country have been so badly damaged that the voice of this, this civil society is not reaching the people hmm? it is a complete capture of the media it is a com- com- complete uh, uh, use of almost uh, gobels like uh, forcing of lies and repeating them all over the country that that is ha- happening and that is why the the need for going beyond civil society the need for political parties actually going to the people and raising their voice not depending on the institutions to def- defend them just as they did not during the british rule if gandhi ji had waited for the correct media and the correct judiciary and the correct police no movement would have ever happened right so i don't think we need to blame the civil society i think civil society is doing what it can in the absence of the main political parties taking up the battle hmm? and they are laying down the path which the political parties need to take up thank you dr abdul jabbar sir thank you very much uh, short, it's, a, it's, it's a remarkable uh, it's a remarkable uh, discussion panel uh, today uh, so i come from the south because i never felt uh, the partition effects of partition uh, i grew up uh, uh, in the south during the, the time of uh, kamaraj he gave a remarkable educational standard for rural people I, i was the beneficiary of that also he came up with the plan kamaraj plan he understood at the time i think 20 years of the independence of independence that the people have become very comfortable in, in the political uh, positions officials that he wanted people to get out of these chairs and get to the people also i think my question has been maybe uh, nehru state over state uh, 17 years it may be he could have really relinquished his position for 10 after 10 years and then gave the pay for new leaders to come up maybe the past uh, informs the present because of that probably there's a way Uh, it has been done uh, his stay uh, well, uh, then it became a family dynasty that these people are banging on that so just uh, this is my comment if you want to really 
elaborate on it a little bit, uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. You see, I share the, the positive vibes you are uh, talking about, which emerged from the South. Hmm? And at the moment, the South looks like a different country altogether. Hmm? And when, when we want to sort of breathe fresh air, <laughs> we, we travel to the South where there is still openness, where you, there is still debate, where there is much more equity, particularly in states like Kerala and uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu, where, where there is a model which is the opposite of the Gujarat model that we see happening, etc. All that is very well accepted. Hmm? But my problem is with Nehru staying for too long, hmm? dynasty and all that. This is like saying, if only you know, Gandhiji had not struggled for 30 years, but struggled only for 20 years, much, much better things would have happened. Hmm? The, we must realize that these are not the, the current generation. I mean, let us not put back into the leaders of our national movement the same logic with which we treat the current politician. Uh, so I, I don't know what so I, I, yeah, I can I can interrupt you a little bit. Thank you. So I'm I'm looking at the US history. Washington, when he became the uh, the prime uh, the president of the country, father of the nation, he voluntarily relinquished uh, position after two terms. So eight years. So that is the one I'm thinking about. If you have established this kind of tradition. In India, it would all be different. That's what I'm talking about. Suchita, you want to say I, something? Yeah, I wanted to. Yeah, just say that you know, Gandhiji officially left the Congress. He was not even a forerunner member after 1934, but he came back whenever it was needed. At every point, he was there. Um, so, you know, it's not a question of Nehru stepping down or Gandhi stepping down and the implications, you know, they were, they had, and no one was there for power. I think that point is something I just wanted to uh, support what you were saying. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tariq Bhai, you're next. Okay, I had a different question, but some of it has been answered, so I'll change my question. And partly in response to what has been said, Nehru could have been a saint, but uh, yeah, he was a human being. And he was only prime minister for 17 years, keep that in mind. And he established a foundation for the modern India, which separates us from our neighboring countries in the region. What surprises me, and this is my question, what surprises me that we've seen what separates us from other countries in the region, which which adopted fanaticism and uh, went downhill, that we are now reverting back to that model, failing to see what differentiated us. So where is that going to take us? And why are we not more, more actively opposing it? I know that there are people in opposition in the civil society in India, but I see a lot of my friends, Hindu friends here, who have benefited from the policies of the past, who are doing very well as NRIs, but are the greatest supporters of, uh, of uh, Modi and Modiism. So can you please explain that, somebody? You need to explain that. And this is what is the most shocking aspect, hmm? that the beneficiaries of what Nehru created hmm, are the ones who are now emerging as the biggest critics of the Nehruvian idea. What is even more shocking is that it is coming from the scientific community. The most, the greatest Hindutva supporters come from the engineers and the doctors and in the West. Not, who would, not who scientists. Would not, who would not last there even for a week if those societies uh, adopted the Hindutva kind of strategy. That is, if they became said, we are a Christian country, what the hell are you Hindus doing here? They wouldn't last there even for a day. But... Over there, they ask, argue for human rights, equality, racial uh, equity. And here, they, they, they perpetuate and argue for and fund a completely racist, fascist ideology. It's really shocking. Thank you. Amir Bhai, you're next. Amir Bhai? It's trying to... Uh, thank you. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Going back to the vilification of uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Nehru, um, I'm reminded of the historian Carlyle, who 
had suggested that history is only the biography of a great man. Indian modern history uh, truly is the biography of Mahatma Gandhi and Nehru from that criteria. So I'm not concerned about the what is the vilification uh, and the cur current situation is because the legacy of both Nehru and Gandhi is completely preserved in the world history. So it is what's going on is a transient, um, is a, a, a short-lived phenomena and um, probably will not deserve a small chapter in, in the history of India. But my question is uh, that uh, being all that is, what surprises me is the importance or um, inability of organizations like Indian Congress um, he's gone down so much, they cannot uh, successfully divert the attention of Indian masses to their problems because they have been overwhelmed so much by this polarization, divisiveness of Modi and his followers that they cannot see, um, the, divert the attention, or focus the attention on the plight of the poor people. Uh, deprivation, all kinds of problems, ordinary masses are suffering in India. Uh, they have been so unsuccessful yes, in that there is no articulation. Yes, um, and maybe you have some idea yes. of what, what's going on and uh, why the Modiism is flourishing so much in the face of other miseries and poverty and deprivation. Thank you. Very wise comments. And we only hope that you are right, that this will be a short-lived phenomenon. Of course, in the long run, as Mudula was saying, of course, in the long run, uh, Nehru and Gandhi cannot be wiped out, and certainly not from the global history. But if, if the short run is long enough in India, the price that we will pay for it would be very, very, very heavy. Hmm? You know, the price, the German people, one of the most advanced in the sciences, in philosophy, in music, in every field, hmm? till Hitler came to power. Hmm? The price that the German people had to pay for allowing that pestilence to continue for even a couple of decades hmm, has been huge. And if, if we must realize that, that even in the short run, we cannot allow this. But you're right, in the long run, we shall win. I want to just add here that uh, just as what Aditya said, the price was not only paid by the German people. The, the fascism in Germany and Italy, the price was paid by the world. The price was paid by the whole of Europe in a terrible way. 20 million died in Russia in order to fight the Second World War. Three or five, four million died in Stalingrad alone. And you can go on counting. And I have been recently talking especially to my friends uh, outside India and telling them that tell the world the way things are going in India the path we are going on, the price will be paid by the whole world. Certainly South Asia, but bigger than that, because India is a huge country. Don't forget the size of India, just sheer population-wise. Don't forget its economic size also today. The size of the minorities. Don't forget the size of the minorities in India. The Muslim minority is 200 million. Three or four European countries put together. So the scale of the disaster that could befall if we, if we go down this path is very difficult to even imagine. And to imagine that it will not have an impact on the world as a whole. I mean, this is just myopic. Therefore, it's the responsibility today of the entire world, not just the diaspora. Diaspora particularly to tell the people there and the governments with which they have a relationship they all need to understand the gravity of what's going on in this country. I don't think it's yet understood. It is not just weakening of democracy that we are seeing. It's not just an attack on some institutions. It's not a few individuals who are being put in jail or a few this thing here and a few this thing. There is a systematic going, you know, what is happening is a systematic decimation of democracy and a systematic building of alternative structures and a kind of, the, you saw what happened in the CA and NRC with COVID, you know, there has been a break now for two years. Uh, you know, the government also hasn't gone further. 
But now, if imagine if they start resuming implementation of CA and NRC, what's going to happen on the ground? No, I mean this needs to be impressed upon the world. It's intellectuals, it's political leaders. What's happening in India today? It cannot be. And today, as in the world today, all battles are international battles. There are no national battles. When Russia. when in the soviet union the change took place it was because of the world pressure that it happened so all things are so interconnected today and we need to work therefore with support systems with integrated uh, you know resistance because one affects the other very very significantly so i'd like to make an appeal to all of you thank you uh we we are, we are approaching almost 1 o'clock it's quite late in india so but i would invite uh, professor ravi uh, and professor both prakash to say anything they would like to thank you um very much uh, fazal sahab and raji sahab um we you know you know we are in presence of three premier historians of modern india and historians are often asked about the past i would uh, today ask about future um and, and to all three of them can partition be undone i am asking in the long run and so that the effects you know poisonous effects of partition and hindu muslim divide uh, somehow we find a way to deal with on the subcontinent now when i ask the question i realize that the question will be looked at very differently from different sides of different borders that have been created in uh, mm -hmm. modern history on the subcontinent um so i hope uh, the question will be taken in the proper light i am i do not want any country uh, which has lived in as an independent country to be wiped out from the map you know what i mean is that mm -hmm. we have suffered from hindu muslim divide that sits it can be debated or how much it has been raked up created by poisonous uh, ideologies and forces and how much you know it has existed to to some extent those identities have existed in society itself um so um there is it <coughs> from doing something about the fact uh, that stays in the society and in the civilization so that it cannot be misused only one comment i can add is that when we put the blame side and and the poisonous politics that flows out of it on the political actors alone then indirectly we blame those political actors who are opposed to uh, the 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 communal uh, and uh, poisonous political actors in the sense that something we did not do right that is why they succeeded and uh, that i feel little uncomfortable about that you know i feel that the level playing field is not fair I, as i often say in india as far as you know the social uh, mind is concerned social structure is concerned and it was greatness of gandhi and nehru that they dealt with it you know with their you know and stalwarts as they were um but uh, the reality of uh, the indian society should also be acknowledged so that a proper strategy is could how to deal with the hindu muslim right. is there registration to shetan all right i think <laughs> we should be really very very brief and this is one uh, almost one and so now another 7 8 more minutes after that many people really wish, would like to leave so uh, thank you ravi sahab and if both prakash sahab hain so that would be fine or uh, there was a question yeah. and no no uh, thank you Th thank you but i i i i thought it was a fantastic uh, very engaging discussion uh, today i mean i thoroughly enjoyed it uh, so thank you for for organizing this but i really don't have anything to add to this right. though of course from my perspective of course many of the things that i had argued in my partition lecture have been borne out by the speakers also today but hopefully i'll get an occasion to discuss some of that later on but thank yeah. you rajesh sir yeah.
Okay, I brought your name because last uh, event was yours and where you talked a lot about partition yeah, literature. Can so, I make a short comment on uh, yeah. Ravi Sam's Ravi comment? Yeah. After uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure Sucheta is the right person to, uh, to deal at no, least no, with no. the first. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, certainly the part partition cannot be undone mm -hmm. through the Akhand Bharat way. <laughs> we, we, we are not going to force, uh, you know, unity on any part of the world, and that that is just out of the question. If there is any possibility of it being undone, it is it would be in the Gandhian way, which is to make the borders immaterial, hmm? you know, we make them irrelevant. Which what what the the part of the world which probably fought the dirtiest and the most uncivil wars in the world, hmm? that is Europe. Even they tried to do was through the European Union, just make the borders irrelevant. I mean, that that is the only way. There is no question of undoing and making it all into one Akhand Bharat from, from Indonesia to God knows where they want to take it. I mean, if you read the literature in Akhand Bharat, it's half the world virtually. <laughs> you know, that is certainly not going to happen. And as for blaming the opposition leaders, Ravi Saab, it is not a question of uh, blaming. Uh, it, it is the, the thing is who you the alternative is even worse, which is to say the reason why we are here is because those guys are bad. Now we know those guys are bad. The issue is what are the good guys able to do, and why are they not able to do it? In which again to say that the situation is very bad is no answer. For a historian, you know, we we could give you much worse situations where people. Where, where adequate leadership and adequate thinking made fundamental changes. And the best example is the recent colonial past, hmm? where, the, where the situation in every count that you see today was worse. And still something could be done. So therefore, one must take responsibility and by not blaming the, anybody, but by saying that us, those who are supposed to be the opposition, need to, need to think of better, smarter ways of intervening. Thank you. So um, yeah, I just wanted one uh, sentence, Razi Saab, if I may. Um, yes. I yes, think please. today the possibility of even a union on the lines of the European Union seem very bleak. We are at the moment at a particularly bad low in terms of the political relations uh, thing, and but. I think my own understanding is uh, of international politics is that um, once the US retreats from their interest in Afghanistan and this part of the world is not so crucial to them as a theater of their the of hegemonic guy. operations, etc., then Kashmir, the importance of Kashmir as a something to play with uh, as it has been, will recede. And why I'm saying this is to remind those of you who are my age, and a lot of you are my age, not very young people. So that you recall in the early 1990s, when this question was asked, the question which Ravi is asking, we were much more hopeful about it then. It was not just the joke, which many of you remember that if uh, Benazir married Rajiv Gandhi, then the two <laughs> countries would become united. <laughs> this was a very popular joke. Yeah. But you know, sometimes as you know, jokes also, you know, like stereotypes have a some ink, you know, element of some core of uh, reality, possible reality in them. So at that moment, I remember at a conference on partition where in Delhi, where we had a lot of participation from Pakistan, from Pakistani historians um, at the National Institute of Punjab Studies. They were, um, Ed, Ed Zas Hassan, who was the PPP, uh, very important uh, uh, MP and all that, the senator, I should say. So anyway, I won't go into the details. The point was that in the early 90s, when two Germanys got united, when the Soviet Union broke up, 
there was there seemed to be a possibility of some kind of union which was not merging the countries not at all of course but some kind of a union and there was talk of trade again another joke uh, which was just let the punjabis open up the borders and let the punjabis trade and there will be no hostilities you know but that again mirrored something so i am just hinting that maybe some years down the line when the geopolitics politics internationally might change you know the, then because it we are all victims of this uh, international games what is happening to us then i think till then i think it's only civil society initiatives and that's why i focus today on memory work and on uh, what do we do uh, within our societies across can we have uh, um histories of partition written um and put together by pakistani and indian historians the sort of thing which we've tried in the earlier but hasn't quite worked you know i think we need to uh do a lot of this kind of work or reproach more uh, at a cultural educational civil society level till then thank, thank you. you thank you um well there one comment that uh, a hand was raised by dr ifat uh, are you still do you want to make a comment or a brief question but just one sentence yes yes no absolutely thank you no i thought we were running out of time that's why i lowered my hand i really admire this discussion this is so enlightening and refreshing i totally agreed with, agree with professor mukherji that the road india is going down is a dangerous road it's a slippery slope and is very very difficult to reverse this this downhill path until a major tragedy happens and people realize you you mentioned about talking to others and make them understand that you know this is a dangerous area you are going into the problem is there is a wall people hear what they want to hear we all subscribe to the media outlets that kind of agree with our opinions and the other side does the same thing and there is just no exchange there is hardly any exchange i have seen this in the us and in in india's hindutva movement that hindus have been sold on the idea that the minorities have been usurping your rights they were given a lot of favor and you were the victims trump has done the same thing to the white nationalists in america that you are the victims and i just don't know how you break that cycle thank you you sound so intellectual the fasa very good aapki zarra nawazi hai